Great. All right. This is Sarah with Fangirls Going Rogue. It is so amazing to talk with you. Hey. And and I loved when Din took off his helmet for the first time in the Believer episode, which you directed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this new season is going to follow Din's journey because of the repercussions of those moments. So I'd love for you to talk about why removing that helmet is so crucial to Din's journey in The Mandalorian. I, yeah, uh, I think, you know, Din Djarin as a character was introduced to us as The Mandalorian. We didn't even know his name. We didn't have any idea about who he was or his background, but we knew and he had this this creed and this belief system that was built around being Mandalorian and the helmet and the removal of the helmet was so instrumental and to to that creed. And so I, I think just in terms of, you know, who he is as a character because of this bounty uh, from the moment he got this bounty and it was revealed what it was, it's it's completely re you know wired his ideas about all of it his, both his identity as a bounty hunter but then he has his identity as a as a mandalorian and so when we were coming to that episode um knowing that with that there would have to come a time when you know those beliefs had uh came up against reality came up against sort of what he needed to do particularly to protect this child and and what would he do in that circumstance if he had to take off this helmet? Um, so I, I think he made that choice. I think he made the right choice. Uh, but obviously, even sometimes when we make the right choices, it it has repercussions that reverberate uh, beyond. So I think in in this case, and and as we begin the season, that's exactly where we are. And and even though he has this child now in his care in a more permanent way um those decisions for those who brought him in that covert who took him in are still going to have um lasting consequences which then jaren has to uh now find a way to atone for yeah. hi rick i'm caitlin from sky talker is it so nice to talk to you today hey nice to meet you our question is your episode of the mandalorian have been some of our favorites in the past what themes or concepts are you most excited to explore when you take on a new episode? Yeah, um, I'm always trying to find uh, a bit of complication, you know, <laughs> in, in in the episodes that I do, or or something that feels like I, I can explore uh, a, a larger thematic idea, even though it's within the context of this world that's that's very. Uh, very different than than the one we live in and so i why well, what i liked about you know my second episode was you know this this bounty hunter was faced with the decision he made then to to not you know uh or that he's going to now have to face this this child and what this child means as he now has to deliver it to wherever he needs to deliver it to um and how that changes his ideas of the world. And then that obviously culminates in when he takes off his helmet for, for this kid uh, for the same reason. But, you know, that episode was, was very much starting to plant the seeds of, well, what is, what are our beliefs? What are, what do we really stand for? And if we only stand for them when they're convenient, then are they really truly our beliefs? And he got challenged in some ways by the unlikeliest character in, in Mayfield, Bill Burr, um, in that episode. And so, you know, I, I think this season becomes sort of a continuation of that conversation now that we see not only, you know, is, is he as a Mandalorian um, has a certain set of beliefs, but we know that there are other Mandalorians like Bo-Katan and and her crew that have a different sort of idea of what that is so how those come together and what that means when those ideas that are so very different have to then you know sort of uh intermingle i, I think that sort of complication has always been really fascinating for me and this season certainly has a lot of that that we will expand on and and so that i think is really the kind of stuff that i like to really get in, involved in as a as a director and, and a filmmaker hey there i am richard from sky walking through neverland and it's so great to speak with you hey good oh. to see, talk to you too <laughs> 
for the episodes that you directed for season three, was there a particular musical direction you gave Joseph Shirley that you can tease us with? Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think what's, uh, the first of all, I think Joe's work on this has been phenomenal. And, and obviously, you know, he's he's worked with Ludwig and 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 been a part of that and sort of continues on those themes that were built but also just you know because of the the size and scope and scale of of this season um and I think they've they've all been been big in their own right but this this certainly has uh, a very you know cinematic feel to it so I think what what Joe has done throughout the season um is is build upon that and and some of those themes feel very much like the ones that you know we we know and love and are familiar with because it's just just the scale of the show now sort of warranted something like that um so i i, I do feel like we're we're feeling some of the opera and <laughs> this time this season around as joe as joe starts to uh to tackle the music so well thank you very much and you have yeah. spoken <laughs> I have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're Kerwin and Keith from Father Son Galaxy. How are you, Rick? Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, you guys? Nice I just want to say that I've been a big fan of your work from the very beginning. Um, I enjoy The Wood and Brown Sugar. They're wonderful films. Oh, my good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Your episodes in The Mandalorian have been praised for their ability to capture the spirit and the essence of the Star Wars universe. What do you think are some of the key elements of your episodes that make them resonate so strongly with the audience? And how do you balance the expectations of diehard fans with the need to appeal to a wider audience? Oh, wow. Uh, quite a question. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have a, a specific answer because I think for me, I'm not necessarily, when I approach it, I don't approach it like uh, it's Star Wars. You know, I... I because I think what was what I loved about this this world and what was so special is that it felt very real and grounded and these characters were real to me and the and the things they were dealing with um, in terms of family, in terms of, you know, just sort of uh, adventure, in terms of just the the call to want to to make change all all felt so real to me. So um and so that was all put into this world that was uh one conceived by george that was that had all this technology and all these different alien species and it had the force and it had jedi but ultimately the stories were about these people and so my approach has always been that i'm trying to find this the story that resonates with me as a human being and and then hopefully all the things that make Star Wars what it is, you know, enhances that. And and so that's always been been my my approach is to just say, you know, let me just tell tell this story, and then hopefully it 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 resonates. Um, and then if and, and then I, I think for for me, um, being a fan of of the of the original and and just what George Lucas was able to create, I've always just tried to to be true to that. Uh, and and George sort of created this this story that was about this particular galaxy, but he was living in a world that was very real, and those themes and ideas were coming through um, in the work he was doing. And so I think in the same way, that's what I'm trying to do as I as I approach each episode or, or the work that I'm doing is is it sort of relates to me in a way that's very real. Um, and I think that's what makes Star Wars Star Wars is at the end of the day, it's still real people, <laughs> even though uh, it's in a it's in a galaxy far away. So that's always been my approach. Hi, I'm Brian with the Full of Sith podcast. Um, uh, all right. Wait. Rick, thanks for for talking to us. Um, I read in an interview that you did that the the different directors always bring something of their own to the table for each episode of the show. And one of the things I've always really been fascinated by are like those cinematic influences. When we talked to John Favreau and and Dave Filoni earlier today, they talked about like Paper Moon and Seven Samurai. And I know I know you kind of come from um, a 
different world of filmmaking, maybe sometimes than they might. What stuff are you falling back on? What influences or inspires you as you're sitting down to work on your episodes in, in season three? Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, look, a lot of those influences are are universal and and they were the same things that that influenced me as as a filmmaker. And certainly, you know, as George was creating Star Wars, influenced him. Um, but, you know, so I, I don't necessarily like and, and I don't always sort of look at specific films or genres as a as a as a touch point. But there were, you know, there were a couple of things, especially in past seasons that I that I really sort of looked at as I was thinking about my episodes in, in season one, episode two, the, the child. I was really thinking about the kid, the Charlie Chaplin film, um, because in many ways, uh, you know, I was telling the story with very little dialogue. I don't think, you know, I think the first half of the film or first half of the ep episode, there's not one word of dialogue spoken. And so how do you tell this story um, about this relationship uh, when you don't have words to help you? And so I I went back and looked at a lot of those films. Um, particularly that one. And so that became an influence. And then as I was thinking about, you know, writing again, my episode season two, I, I was thinking a lot about uh, Wages of Fear, this this uh, this, uh, this film that I'd seen about these men who transport nitroglycerin. <laughs> and so, uh, so there was something about how, you know, because they were in these life or death circumstances, these people who often were from different points of view in those moments were sort of free of 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 fear, so they could kind of reveal themselves to each other. And so I think for for Mando and Mayfeld being on a similar kind of adventure, uh, I felt could be a, an interesting way to, to sort of challenge. Mando's ideas from someone who probably wouldn't be able to challenge him otherwise. Um, and so for this season, there's there's not necessarily one film or thought th that I have in mind, but I I do think about these themes about what, you know, what defines us, what is our ideology, how does that, how does that define us individually, but then what what does it mean to be a part of a larger group? Um, and some of those ideas are going to be revisited here this season. And I, and I'm really excited about those, those bigger picture ideas around the Mandalorians as we, as we get into season three that are, have been seeded, but now are really going to come to, to real fruition. But, um, but I don't necessarily have a specific <laughs> movie in mind, but I, I think that's really where, where this season is. Hey, uh, Dan Zare from Coffee with Kenobi. One What's of my up? favorite things about the behind the scenes of the first season, besides you wearing the Jays, of course, best <laughs> best dressed director in Star Wars. There you go. Uh, I liked hearing about your uh, the production and you all sitting together in that roundtable. If you could talk about your role in the production of the show and how it's evolved this season and how does that impact your role as a director? Yeah, um, what's been incredible about this experience uh, is, of course, my my Star Wars fandom <laughs> and geekdom has been you know uh, thoroughly expressed, but but really the the environment that was created by John John Favreau and Dave Filoni as this show was coming together really set the tone for um, the experience of 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 making this story, and, and it was so collaborative and so open, and and he was so open to each director bringing their point of view uh, to, to, the, to the larger storytelling that it really created a, a sort of a, a family dynamic in, in terms of how these stories come together. And it didn't feel like you're sort of passing a story from one person to another, but everyone was sort of a, telling, telling the same story and sort of understood it. And there was a unique way that that first season came together because we were all sort of new to, te to the technology and sort of had to really know what everyone else was doing that informed the process moving forward. So because it's it's always been that and John has sort of been the one who do has done most of the writing, if not all of it, uh, it doesn't have the feel of 
like, you know, what I guess would be traditional television. So it, it's always felt very collaborative in that way. So as my role um, expanded uh, specifically because I was also writing and, and you know, after the first episode I directed, John asked me to do another episode and, and also write on it. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to to sort of be a part of his process and that process as he's been writing um, and thinking about the seasons as they're coming together. And, and, and that was the case in season two. You know, he asked me to write a, an episode. And so that meant, you know, hearing and talking to him about his process and what he was bringing together and talking to Dave and, and trying to let it make sure it all lined up as I was writing, um, because it wasn't like a traditional writer's room. Um, um, so we all had to be aligned in what we were writing. So it, it helped me sort of see the overall arc of, of storytelling. So that's been, this season has been sort of a natural progression of that. And that now that I'm coming on both as a director, but also executive producer, um, being able to have been a part of that process since season one, and now it's sort of expanded in a way that there's trust between the three of us, trust between myself and John. Um, and as the the show just got bigger and bigger, it it's something that I think we all, having been a part of it from the beginning, needed to all get our arms around. So I was I was, so I I sort of expanded my role in in that way. But in some ways, it still it still feels very familiar to, to what we've been doing since since season one. Thank, Thank you guys. Time. Can't wait until Wednesday. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> us neither hey look at those names to the left they are part of the sky walking force our patreon become a producer yourself and check out all the disney plus themed bonus content available depending on the level you subscribe become a member of the elite sky walking force at skywalkingforce.com <laughs>